Everyone loves a visit to an amusement park. It seems just about anybody at some point in their life has set out on a warm summer day to see what wonders an amusement park holds. Maybe your first stop is at a classic roller coaster, or maybe you're more in the mood to go to war at a bumper car track. Maybe rides aren't your thing, but you just like the atmosphere around the merry-go-round. Nevertheless, most likely when you think of amusement parks, places like Disney World, Universal Studios, or maybe even more locally, a Six Flags park comes to mind. While this may be the case, over the past century and a half, there have been parks that were kings of their days, only to be lost to time, with one of them being Charlotte's Ontario Beach Park on the outskirts of Rochester. Coined the Coney Island of the West, the park first opened in 1884 and would be host to 25 memorable summers, closing its doors for good in 1919. Prior to the development of an amusement park, the land that the park would eventually sit on was nothing exceptional, at least attraction-wise. During the 1850s and 1860s, the park was host to nothing more than day trippers looking to splash in the waves of Lake Ontario for a few hours and call it a day. Though as the area grew in popularity, seating was placed in the park and a ball field was constructed. It grew in popularity to the point that the hamlet of Charlotte was not ready for the sudden boom in people present in the area and had to begin the construction of restaurants, hotels, bars, and other pleasurable accommodations to account for the sudden surge in people present. During its first years of operation, it seemed attendance only grew, and by opening day 1889, 12,000 people were present for the new form of entertainment that amusement parks presented. By opening day 1907, it is estimated that 42,000 eager people were present. As a result of many visitors of the park being recent immigrants from faraway lands such as Germany, the designers of the park catered to these demographics by incorporating certain elements to grab their attention. Referred to as the German Village, a row of structures styled after traditional German architecture were constructed. They sold schnapps, pretzels, beer, and other souvenirs. If perhaps a guest of the park was in more of a Japanese mood, they could make their way to the Japanese Village, which housed a garden, an oriental-styled bridge, and even a Shinto shrine. Catering to even those who found themselves in the mood of romance, an area of the park referred to as the Venison Canals were built. The 1,600-foot boat ride provided a place for young couples to feel as if they were exploring the canals of Italy itself. A popular hotel known as the Spencer House was constructed in 1873 and housed many dining rooms, parlors, dressing rooms, and even a barn large enough to hold 100 horses. Along with the Spencer House, many other hotels began sprawling up, leading to the growing reputation Charlotte had as a lake resort. In 1874, a local brewer, Henry Bethalome, built his own resort complex, which served, of course, his own beer, though additionally served German-inspired foods, further contributing to the growing desire of visitors to seek out foreign tastes. The park over the passing years grew in popularity to the point more and more means of direct transportation to it were provided. Like many other amusement parks, railroads had a great deal of interest in its success, as more visitors meant more passengers on their railways. Many trains, as well as trolley lines, were configured straight into the park. However, they passed along many hotels or other points of interest, creating additional buzz for the tourism industry in the region. While trolley lines from Rochester were directed specifically towards Charlotte for Ontario Beach Park, they additionally stemmed towards other resort areas such as Crescent Beach, Manitou, Somerville, Glen Haven on Arundacoit Bay, and of course the rival amusement park, Seabreeze. Though regardless of the popularity of these other destinations, Ontario Beach Park had earned in its own right a reputation of being a place worth visiting. The New York State Railways Company even began operating a trolley with the word Charlotte on the side of their vessels. It cost a nickel for a ride, and the line came from Rochester's Four Corners in just under a half an hour. While other railroad lines managed other amusement parks, Ontario Beach Park was the product of New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. Trying to account for the large number of guests from further points, the NYC and HRRR built a balloon-shaped railroad track that encircled much of the park. Additionally, more railroad companies funneled into the area like the Rome, Watertown, and Ogdensburg Railroad, whose passengers were dropped off just outside the park. With the growing forms of transportation into the area, it was not unheard of seeing the park peak at 30,000 guests in a single day. For people who perhaps wanted to take advantage of the park being on the shores of Lake Ontario as well as the Genesee River, transportation could be provided through a ferry boat ride referred to as the Windsor, though its length was exceptionally short, less than 500 feet in length across the Genesee River. The park at times was almost categorized as a circus, as the sights that could be seen ranged from heavyweight boxers going at it, daredevils taking on the most anxiety-inducing of tasks, to even elephants bathing in Lake Ontario. Along with elephants, there were polar bears that would slide down a chute into the lake as well, as well as dogs, 
donkeys prowling on the property, and more. If people weren't interested in the natural wonders of the animals, then perhaps they were drawn into the revolutionary new invention of flight. In 1891 alone, it is estimated that over 50,000 people witnessed a ZI-129 go up. It was a cigar-shaped balloon that had the rider sitting in a framework attached to the bottom of the airship. To make the aircraft lift, hydrogen gas was created through a pouring of sulfuric acid into a tarline barrel of iron fillings. There is one instance of a man who was essentially a skydiver, and as he made his way to the ground, a gust of wind caught his parachute, bringing him 18 miles away from his initial landing point. Luckily, he survived, as the U.S. Life Savers Corps rescued him. When seeking a more classically accepted form of entertainment, guests could find their way to the auditorium, which itself was architecturally unique. It was a two-storied, octangle-shaped pavilion. Large orchestras oftentimes would fill the air with the sounds of classical music. As time passed, however, the entertainment style began to return to one that was more resemblant of a circus. One show that became regular was marketed as Out of the North and consisted of a Canadian natives dressed in their traditional clothes being essentially put on display, even expected to endure the harsh summer sun. Additionally, there was even a time when there was a show that had several African tribal peoples on display, finding themselves being more of a gimmick these people were extremely displeased and it is said management sent them back to from where they came and instead replaced them with a black family from Georgia. They were expected to still represent an African tribe but to be a more what they felt lively. Aside from the shows, rides were obviously the biggest attraction to the park. They ranged from the Virginia Reel which had cars swing back and forth in the air to the water toboggan which had brought riders plunging into the waves of Lake Ontario. The chair swing was, was a popular attraction which was placed on a tall tower and spun riders around on highly decorated double seats. One of the more unique attractions to the park was referred to as Fighting the Flames, which was a building which was intentionally set ablaze at various intervals throughout the day. It gave the illusion of a full on fire as actors would come rushing out of the building, alarm bells would be ringing, and firemen would be hurrying to the rescue. To make this so called story all the more enticing, Two women were stranded on the upper floors of the building awaiting rescue, eventually being forced to jump to a net below. Once successfully removed from the building, the crowd would applaud. Even with the variety of entertainment across the park, over the years, attendance began to dwindle. It is said that the creation of the automobile, as well as the outbreak of World War I, greatly impacted the popularity of Ontario Beach Park. With the car, People were no longer confined to where railroad tracks could carry them and instead had endless possibilities of where to venture to. And with such devastation in the First World War, people were less interested in the draws of an amusement park. Inevitably, the choice came to close the park and eventually the city of Rochester purchased the land it sat on. Shockingly, however, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts claimed they owned the shoreline and attempted to obtain the property and it wasn't until a 1926 Supreme Court ruling that this claim was rejected. As the years passed, there were less and less displays that there was ever an amusement park. The once prominent Ontario Hotel was converted into a chain restaurant, with much of its architectural integrity being removed, including its Victorian Tower. The area where the once iconic Midway stood was instead replaced by pavilions constructed by the city of Rochester. Today, there is almost no evidence that there was an amusement park, with most visitors likely unaware there was ever any such attraction. There is, however, a carousel built by the Denzel Carousel Company that still stands and has been in its current location since 1905. It is even considered a Rochester historic landmark. Today, there are only 100 American-made carousels left in the country. The rarity of certain items drives prices up for certain animals, such as a giraffe up to $65,000. Regardless of the minimal physical reminders that an amusement park ever stood, there are plenty of old postcards that seem to do a pretty decent job of capturing the spirit of the park. And with so many amusement parks still in operation, it is safe to say that this form of entertainment is anywhere close to being over.